Does your life ever, or does li- like your life or just life in general, does it ever feel fickle for its fleeting nature? Does it ever feel insignificant because of its brevity? Does it ever feel meaningless because of its temporality? Perhaps absurd for its abruptness. Life is short, it's tough, it's fading. So, how then do we live the good life in the face of that reality? Some have answered that question. The good life is maximizing pleasure. I'm going to squeeze out every last bit of toothpaste that is the highs of life. Some have answered the question. The good life is maximizing legacy, to leave behind a name worth remembering. Some have said that the good life is minimizing pain or discomfort to make it through with as little agony as possible. Others have said that the good life is minimizing my carbon footprint to live as if I've never, that I never existed. The people of God have been wrestling with the question of what is life and what is the good life since the beginning? Like all people, the writer of Ecclesiastes, which is in the Old Testament, he was known as the wisest of wise men. He seems to have accumulated much wealth. He seems to have had a legacy of legacies. And he wrote this in reflecting on life, trying to describe the fleeting nature of life, yet the beauty of life and the reality of it. He wrote many things. One of the things he said is this. We are here today, gone tomorrow. We are but a vapor. And I think he would say that knowing this, we are to avoid two extremes. One, despair over the transience of of life. Even though this is the regular experience that we have, we should not despair. He'd also say... We need to find all of our joy, not in the temporary things available to us, but in something else. We must avoid, he would say, the maxim, nothing lasts forever, therefore what's the point? Now if you read Ecclesiastes, he'll say that same thing over and over again, and he will conclude, but that's no way to live. (laughs) He tells us that even though life is but a vapor, we're here today, gone tomorrow, that God has actually placed eternity in our hearts. It's Ecclesiastes 3.11, if you want to go back and read a little about that. So, how do we live in this balance of life is temporary, but God has put eternity in our hearts, and, and what do we do with that? That's what I'm hoping to unpack a little bit today. Um, We're going to philosophize a little bit on the purpose, the meaning of life, the good life. And and we're going to look at Jesus' words. Jesus will give us some chilling, mysterious, but ultimately existent, transforming words today. This is at the very end of his final instruction to his original disciples right before he's arrested, ultimately crucified, And as we'll celebrate next Sunday, risen from the dead. But these are the last things he said. The disciples don't know that he's about to be arrested. They don't know he's about to be crucified. And they don't know he's about to rise again. So these are the last things he said. And and he'll bounce back and forth between two big ideas that I want to look at. The first idea is this idea of time. What is time? And the second is, what is joy? So time and joy and how they're... Related. So as I read the passage, I want you to see or underline or circle, even if you just grabbed one of the pew Bibles, you can take that, that's yours if you don't have a Bible, and you can underline it so you can follow along. So anytime he references time or joy, pay attention. So you ready to read it with me? So John 16, 16 to 33. Let's read the Word of God. It says this. 
a little while and you will no longer see me. Again, a little while and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, what is this he's telling us? A little while and you will see me. A little while and you, or a little while you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They said, what is this he's saying? A little while. We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him this question. And so he said to them, are you asking one another about what I said? A little while and you will not see me. Again, a little while and you will see me. Seems like a little while is an important word. You might want to underline that. Verse 20. Truly I tell you, this is what Jesus responded to them. Truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Then he gives this great illustration, verse 21. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So, verse 22, you also have sorrow now, right now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. In that day, you will not ask me anything. Truly, truly, I tell you, Anything you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech. A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day... You will ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself, he already loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, look, now you're speaking plainly and not using any figurative language. Of course, I don't know why they say that. Now we know that you know everything and don't need anything to question you. Or sorry, don't need anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus responded responded to them, Do you now believe after what I've just said to you? He's sort of laughing at the fact like he's still being mysterious, but they think, oh, it's so clear now. No, Jesus, it's not happened yet. (laughs) He's like, now you believe? Okay, anyhow, that's funny. Okay, indeed, an hour is coming and has already, or and has already come when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And now he concludes the whole farewell discourse that we've been in for weeks and weeks. And this should help us see why he's given them the speech. He says, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. It's like one of the great proclamations of Jesus. Okay. But... To have this courage is to understand what Jesus is getting at. So did you see the themes of time and joy? The way he bounced back and forth? I mean, so many references to a little while, a little while. The time is coming, the time of birth. But then after that time, in that day, then a time is coming and you'll no longer. And on that day, and an hour is coming, and now. And you see, time is all over this. And then joy references. Scattered throughout. 
your joy, your joy. You will rejoice. Joy and time. And so I was trying to figure out, I always do this, what, what's the win today? Like, if I would define what the win is for after I've done talking, the win is that you still love me, but then also the win would be that perhaps you understand just a little better how time, even though it's fleeting, time is actually a source of joy, not dread. Joy, not dread. So sometimes we have this relationship with time. It's like it's always running out, and we can't get more of it. And, and so time becomes this enemy of ours. And, and if anybody steals a little bit of our time, well, that's our enemy. But what if time is different? It doesn't seem like Jesus has that relationship with time. Why is it? He knows his time is up. He says his hour is coming and has already come. He knows his ministry is up. He knows his time is running out, but he speaks joy. How can this possibly be? Let's try and figure it out. Okay, let's look at verse 16 to 20 again. 16 to 20. A little while you'll see me, and then a little while you won't see me, and then a little while you'll see me. <laughs> he goes on. And his disciples say, what is he talking about? A little while this, a little while that, a little while this. Okay. He gets to the end, he says, well, truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world is rejoicing, but then that whole thing will get flipped around and your sorrow will turn into joy. So there's a little bit of time of this and a little time for that. There's time for everything. So what does this all mean? Well, the first thing you need to say, and he's saying it quite cryptically, and he's saying it cryptically on purpose, but he's talking about his impending death and resurrection. So he's saying, in a little while, I'm with you now, but in a little while, I'm not going to be with you because they're going to, I'm going to die. But, but as soon as when you think that's over, then I'm going to be with you again because I'm going to rise from the dead. So he knows this is going to happen. He's not excited about that. We know that he actually sweats a blood because he's so anxious about it in the Garden of Gethsemane. So he's not excited about it, but he knows there's a time for the suffering and then there'll be a time for the resurrection. And um, the disciples don't know what he's talking about, clearly. They're confused, and that's okay. That's purposeful. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but he's talking about his death and his resurrection. Now, that's for the immediate context. Remember, we've said there's always the immediate context of this speech, and then there's the, the larger context for us. So in the immediate context, he's talking about his death and his resurrection. Um, he wants to tell them this. Like, why doesn't he just leave this out? He wants to tell them so that when they look back, they remember this. And they remember that he said a little while he'll be with them, and then a little while he'll be gone, and then a little while they'll see him again. He wants them to know this. One, because he, he intends to give his life away. Nobody takes it from him. Do you know that? They didn't take Jesus' life. Jesus gave his life. He's telling you right now, that's his plan, to give his life. The second thing is, it highlights, truly highlights for both the original disciples and us as disciples now, the roller coaster nature of life lived following Jesus. I mean, it's just a roller coaster. I mean, think about the roller coaster for the original disciples. This is Palm Sunday that we're celebrating today. This has just happened a few days before he gives this speech. And he walks into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, and people gather around and they cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, God has come, our King is here, the Messiah. I mean, it was cloud nine, it was a mountain, and they're about to go into a valley. I mean, this is the roller coaster of life with Jesus. You have Palm Sunday, then you have this amazing dinner where he gives this amazing speech, and he's about to, in chapter 17, pray this amazing prayer. And then he's going to go get arrested. And then he's going to get crucified. But then he's going to rise from the dead. And then they think, okay, now he'll take over the government. But then he says, I have to leave again. And he ascends to sit in the right hand, at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenlies. Okay, what? Man, the roller coaster. But then 
Jesus' promise comes true, and he sends the Spirit. And they're filled with the Spirit. And the power of Christ is now with them and in them. And, and the love of Christ is poured out in a beautiful... So you see the roller... This is life with Jesus. So if you feel like you're riding a roller coaster, look, Jesus said a little while of this and a little while of that and a little while of this. That's life with Jesus. If you don't want that life, don't get on the roller coaster. There's lots of people who don't like the roller coaster, and they sit on the side and they watch. And they're missing out, in my opinion. But it is a roller coaster, and Jesus has just told you it's a roller coaster. How many times can you say a little while in one verse? Seven is the answer. <laughs> and apparently it's holy <laughs> to, to repeat seven times. So I love that because I repeat myself a lot. Okay, so roller coaster, but I'm giving my life. And the sooner you realize this is what following Jesus is, the sooner you can get on with living. The sooner you can get on with living. So the second thing he's telling us in these first four verses is that, listen, so there's enough suffering to go around. Jesus is about to suffer in a way that no one has ever suffered. And he's going to say, and you will suffer like that. Look at verse 20. Right, he says, the lot of you will be weeping and mourning just in a bit here while the rest of the world is celebrating because of my death. And they'll realize that that was what he was talking about in just a few short hours. They'll realize that's what he meant when the world will rejoice while you mourn and weep. While Jesus hangs on the cross, the world rejoices. Finally, we got rid of of that bugger while we weep and mourn. This is, this is true today as much as it was true back then. The followers of Jesus weep and mourn. Ryan mentioned the newspaper article about Seattle's the least religious city in the United States. We've just beat out San Francisco. Yes! love anytime we beat San Francisco in anything I love it so we got them now the world that is like the people outside of the the community of Christ they celebrate finally we're getting religion out of our society finally we're getting those Jesus folks are all moving to Spokane Boise Alabama Texas, great spots, great spots. They're glad to see us go. And we weep and we mourn, and it's sad that so few people are coming to hear the word of God taught, the word of God sung, the community of Christ gathered, the love poured out. Like, that breaks my heart while the world rejoices. It's a weird dichotomy. So it's true back then, and it's true now, but Jesus' promise is true to the disciples, and it'll be true for us. One day, our weeping and mourning and sorrow will turn to joy. It did for the disciples. It will for us. I look forward to that. And I see that in small increments over and over and over and over again, where someone who was rejoicing that Jesus was taken out of their life or taken out of their society, rediscovers Jesus and now rejoices in Jesus. I see it all the time. I love it. But if we forget that there's a time for everything, we may despair in the moments of sorrow, in the moments of pain, in the suffering. But don't forget Jesus' promise. A little while of this and a little while, it'll be that. Who knows how long that little while will be? I think the disciples had it, you know, easier than most. Two and a half days. They had to wait for the little while to end. But Jesus has promised when he left them 40 days after the resurrection, he said the same thing. In a little while, I'll be back. And we've been waiting, and that little while has stretched 2,000 years. But the promise is still true because Jesus 
is God, and God's view of time is not our view of time. The scriptures tell us a day is like a thousand years. So we think it's been a really long time, but it's just a little long time. And he will come again. And that's the promise that the disciples knew was true when he ascended and said, I'm going and I'll come back. Because he had just said it here, I'm going and I'll come back. We lean on that promise. We look forward to that promise. We understand that God has promised in Jesus that he has not forgotten us. A little while and then he'll be back. So that's, we call that in the church the second coming of Christ. And we look forward to that. Just like he rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, he'll ride on the clouds, Scripture tells us. What that would look like, we don't know exactly. They didn't know what it would look like Jesus coming the first time. He will come in and take his rightful place as the king of the world. And that will be a glorious day. So we're still waiting, just like the disciples, the first disciples, had to wait for the promise to be fulfilled. And what do we do when we wait? We long for it. We pray for it. We sing for it. So it's okay to say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come back. We're ready to have our sorrow turned into joy. It's great to pray that prayer. And don't worry, you won't get him to come before he's ready. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't know if he's not ready. It's like, no, you don't have to pray that. You just say, my desire is for you to come, Jesus, come. And you pray for him to come back, just like he's promised. But you know he will come at exactly the right time, just like he came at the exact right time the first time he came. So glory like this, glory to be anticipated like this, is worth, is worth every ounce of your soul that you pour into that anticipation. And so that's my first question. Do you anticipate the coming of Jesus? Do you anticipate as much or more the coming of Jesus as anything else in your life? Like, honestly, probably most of us would say no. Why not? Because maybe we don't believe his promise. A little while... And then a little while. Maybe we've lost that hope. And we can ask God to fill our hearts with that anticipation. There's nothing quite like anticipating the coming of Jesus. Okay. So there's something in here, and we'll come back to this at the end. I'll just talk about it here. There's something about Jesus' words about time here that just really help us remember the temporality of life, okay? I'm going to come back to it at the end. Human life is temporary, and we, as I said, we should not grieve that fact, but understand that fact so that we can make the most of the, tempora the temporary time that we have. That's what Jesus did, and he didn't seem worried about it, and so we can learn from him. And I think that's why he was so cryptic here, because if he had told them, in a little while I'm going to be arrested... And then in a little while after that, they're going to kill me. <laughs> you know what the disciples would have done? When he wasn't looking, they would have popped him in the back of the head with a wine bottle. And they would have drug him off and hid him in a cave somewhere. That's what they would have done. They wouldn't have understood why he had to do what he had to do. So he's very cryptic here. So more on the temporality of life in just a sec. But let's look at verse 21. Then he gives us this great illustration from... The real world about it. He says, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has, because of the joy, a joy that a person has been born into the world. What a joy that a person has been born into the world. So Jesus it's trying to teach us something here. And don't worry, he's not patronizing mothers everywhere. He's not saying, stop complaining about the pain of childbirth, ladies. <laughs> you know, because look at the great stuff that comes out of it. He's not saying that. I know you guys know that. It's just like, 
Someone could make that case. Of course he's not saying that. He's actually celebrating mothers. He's doing the very opposite. He's celebrating the courage. Remember, that's, remember back to the last verse, verse 33. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. Where? Peace when? When the suffering's at hand. You will have suffering in the world, so be courageous. I have conquered the world. So he's actually using this illustration to celebrate the courage of motherhood. motherhood. So courage is not the absence of fear or the belittling of pain, but it's an acceptance of the struggle for something greater. That's courage. And so it's no secret to anyone that's ever lived on the face of the earth that bearing a child is one of the most painful things that you'll ever do. Everyone knows it. It's not a hidden secret, except to little children who ask you, oh, where did, where did you, where'd my brother come from? And you're like, just, you know, the stork brought it in. We've been lying to kids for millennia. But everyone who's an adult knows the pain. And so every time a woman chooses to go through the process of actualizing a child into the world, this courage is right on the face of it. You know the pain, and yet you walk straight into it. And Jesus is saying, that's courage. And on the other side of that courage is a joy that you don't even know until you know. Like When you look at your child for the first time, joy unspeakable. You don't know it before you go through the pain. You don't. You can't know what that is like until you go through the pain. That's what Jesus is talking about. It's, a, it's the perfect illustration, of course. Your pain is not in vain, Jesus is saying. Childbirth is the perfect illustration that beautiful things come on the other side of painful things. And right at this moment, he knows the disciples are going to go through a pain that they could not imagine, that even if he tried to explain to them, they could not imagine. They're staring death in the face, and he's saying, don't flinch. Pain is part and parcel to following me, Jesus says. But following me also comes with unspeakable joy. Beautiful things that you cannot imagine will show up in your life, but you can't know until you go. That's, oh, that's the rub. You feel the rub? Well, if I just knew, if you could just tell me what it's like, then I'll know that the pain's worth it. He's like, no, 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 this is what faith is. So you could say it like this. God's providence is typically apprehended in the rearview mirror. Like when you see it in the rearview mirror, like, oh, yeah, that was worth it. Now, some of you in the room don't have rearview mirrors yet. You've never walked into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, so you don't have a rearview mirror. So like some of the things that Christians you know say to you feel really weird and like, yeah, I don't get that. Yeah, you don't have a rear view mirror yet and that's okay because the first act of faith is the hardest and scariest act of faith. The first act of faith is the hardest and scariest because you don't have a rear view mirror yet. You don't realize, oh yeah, if I walk with him in faith, look at those things that he's brought us through. So I get that it's hard. That's why you pray and you ask God to give you the faith to walk into something you don't know. Having the second child is much different than having the first child. You know what's on the other side. And you know the pain. The brother of Jesus, who, by the way, at this point that Jesus was saying this, thought his brother was crazy, <laughs> I love that he became a disciple of his brother. 
siblings everywhere should be like, whoa, what would it take <laughs> to call my brother God? So James wrote this, James 1, verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Edward Clink, one of the scholars that I tend to read on when trying to understand the Gospel of John, he wrote it like this. And I think this, he, he gives a, a, an additional layer to this whole thing about suffering and joy. He wrote this, so we've got a slide. He said, what the disciples first received as death and loss, that's the cross, in weeping and mourning will itself become the source of their joy, the source of their joy. Stated more clearly, in this case, Jesus' death was the necessary precondition for life, and what the world first received as victory and joy has become itself the source of their defeat. In a real sense, the judgment and death of Christ is the judgment and death of the world, the judgment and death of sin and rebellion against God. And the resurrection of Christ is a resurrection, a transformation, from the chil for the children of God. A resurrection to life in the Spirit until they are finally received by Christ into the heavenly life He has prepared for them. Now what Clink is trying to point out here is that the cross was necessary to get to the good things on the other side of the cross. So this is like this beautiful scandal of grace. It's the twist of fate that both humbles the apparent victors at the cross, those who are trying to get rid of Jesus, and lifts up the apparent losers, the disciples, at the same time. Those who were honest about their sin, honest about their shortcoming, honest about their rebellion to God, experience the cross as victory. Those who thought they were righteous, thought that they could save themselves, thought that they were wise, actually, when they realize it, the cross is their defeat. This is why we both weep at the cross and laugh at the cross. Like, when you see the cross, you weep tears of repentance, of it was my sin that held him here, there, but at the same time, you giggle in pure joy that your God hung from a cross for you. This answers why we call Good Friday good. Not Sad Friday, it's Good Friday. It's kind of like celebrating a birthday for mothers. Have you ever thought about this? Like, when you celebrate a birthday you're celebrating probably the most painful day of the mother's life. Have you thought about that? What an odd thing to celebrate. But of course we don't think it's odd at all. It's a good day because life came into the world. That's the cross. Victory was birthed on the cross. And yet the pain that Jesus Christ bore on himself and like 1% of that is physical pain. 99% is the spiritual pain of absorbing in his body, in his soul, the sin of the world. And we celebrate it on Good Friday. It's like celebrating a birthday. The most painful day for Allie we celebrate. We throw a party. You remember that day? How painful it was? What an awesome day that was. And she's like, yeah, it was the best day of my life. Isn't that weird? Like, that's the paradox of the cross. Okay. Look at verse 22 to 28. 22 to 28. So, you also have sorrow now. There's a time for sorrow. But I will see you again, 
and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. In that day, and he's talking about after the resurrection, in that day you will ask for anything, and truly I tell you, when you ask in the Father, ask the Father in my name, when you ask in the name of Jesus, the Father will give you what you ask for. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. Now what is he getting at here? Why does he bring up prayer in this moment? Well, prayer is the is the way we communicate with God. It's how we step back into relationship with our Creator. So after the resurrection, in that day, after the resurrection, their joy, the joy of the Lord will fill their hearts when they see it's true. A little while he'll be with us, then a little while he'll be gone, and then we'll see him again. And so after the resurrection, joy now becomes an ever-present reality for all the followers of Jesus. This is so key. Joy is not only those moments when things are going well and God is giving us the material things we want or the promotion we want or this or that, but it's an ever-present reality because of the resurrection, because of the cross. So that, that's so key that he's saying in that day, after the resurrection, that they haven't experienced yet, but when that day comes... Joy will be with you, and no one can take it away. It is an ever-present reality, and some of us need to hear that this morning because joy for us is here today, gone tomorrow. And Jesus is saying, no, after the resurrection, joy is always with you. You can either experience it, acknowledge it, or you can deny it. But it's always there if you see the cross and the resurrection with the right pair of glasses, which is your victory over sin and death. Christ's victory over Satan and the powers of this world, for all time, the victory is won. You now have access, Jesus is telling them, to God in my name in a way that you never had it before the cross and the resurrection. That's gospel. Still come to the class. We'll talk more about that. But that's the gospel. Christ has opened the way. He has given us access now through prayer, we can talk directly to God. And he'll say it in just a second. Because the Father already loves you. And now, through my name, you have access to the fullness of God. And he will give you everything that you ask for in accordance with his will for your good and his plan in the world. He'll give it to you if it aligns with what he's doing in the world. And when you realize that, your joy will be complete. When you realize you have access to God the Creator, God your Heavenly Father, when you, have access, when you realize that, how can you not have joy? That access isn't coming and going. Christ isn't dying and rising again and again and not so much. It's, it's done. It's already there. And when you receive that, you have joy that cannot be taken away. In difficult times, in blessing times, it doesn't matter. The joy is always there. I love that. I hope you experience that in your Christian walk. I don't find a lot of people who do. Yeah, happiness can come and go, but joy is ever-present. Jesus has just told us through the cross that's what he's doing. Your joy will be complete as you pray and partner in the mission of God in the world. Oh, praise God. Okay, now to the big conclusion. Now, I told you it's big. It's going to not feel like a conclusion because it's long. But it's a big conclusion. I mean, in fact, in my notes I write, to close, <laughs> I want to come back to the idea of the temporality of life. I think more deserves to be mentioned here. One thing that the gospel of Jesus Christ reveals to us is that through God, a God who is outside of time, as creator of time and space, God is able to and delighted to step into time and dwell within time through the incarnation of God the Son, who is Jesus of Nazareth. Like that happened in space-time history. The God who is outside of time, who created time, steps into time and lived a human life in our midst. 
And what does that tell us? It means that time and its temporality is capable of commingling with the divine. The eternal and the temporal can coexist. So your life can be both temporary and eternal at the same time. Because it was so in the person of Jesus. May it be in your life. So time is not evil. Time is not your enemy. Though it is fleeting, though it is brief, though it can be abrupt, that does not mean that it's fickle, insignificant, meaningless, or absurd. Because if the God of the universe came and dwelt in time in human form, then he erases that notion by participating in that which can feel like those things. I just love that. There's a pause on that. Now, more importantly, you might say less philosophically and more practically, that means that temporary life can, in fact, be beautiful life. God redeems this and reveals this and restores this truth in the gospel. So let's see if I can expand on this idea. And if I want to expand on an idea, do you know who I talk to? My friend Gregor. Gregor, I see you, Gregor. If you want to expand on an idea and fill, Gregor and I have the best conversations. I had coffee with Gregor just a few weeks ago, not knowing about this passage. And then I realized, oh my goodness, God was teeing us up, Gregor, for this talk, this short conclusion about the temporality of life. And so he introduced me, Gregor did, to this renowned sculptor named Andy Goldsworthy. And Andy Goldsworthy creates a kind of art that is temporary. So he makes art out of ice and driftwood, leaves, stones, dirt, snow, Right out in the open field, on beaches and rivers and creeks and forests, all places where one can be washed away, blown away, taken away. It's temporary art. And it just really struck me. And he sent me some links. And I watched some videos. And so I wanted to show you just a clip from a movie made about the art of Andy Goldsworthy because it will bring to life this conclusion. Okay, so let's hit the lights here. And let's play this short clip, just a two-minute clip, promoting this movie, okay? So here we go. That moment where you're held there, suspended, is a very beautiful moment. Those are the moments that I, I, I strive for, struggle for in everything I do in one way or, or another. There's two different ways of looking at the world. You can walk on the path or you can walk through the hedge. And I think that's the beauty of art, that it just makes you step aside off the normal way of walking or looking. of understanding and clarity in a very chaotic situation, like a shaft of light that just penetrates. And for a moment, it's very clear. And then it all becomes unclear again. So that's Andy, and that's his art. 
And you get a sense, you get a feel for kind of what he's doing. And you can watch more videos and, and things if you'd like on YouTube, Andy Goldsworthy. It's really fascinating art. And when Gregor first mentioned it to me, it just got me thinking about the gospel. And then I read this passage, and I, a little while, I'll be with you, and then a little while, I'll be gone. Jesus just embraces the temporary nature of his ministry in the world. Art reminds us, unlike buildings or money or power, that there is this kind of potentiality in art that is not temporary, but actually can last far beyond. And this, this art, artful living, you could say, is best expressed and modeled by the human life of Jesus. Here we have the eternal God who takes on temporary flesh, lives but a brief yet unignorable life that has reverberated throughout the centuries. I mean, just think of, think of the evidence to the uniqueness of the life of Jesus. Think about how many people know his name. How many people sit and worship him like we do? And then think about how absurdly brief his life was. For 30 years or so, he lived in an obscure town on the north edge of the nation of Israel. Nothing good has ever come from Nazareth, people would say. And then for three years... He decided to walk around and tell people stories and talk about God. And he performed miracles, of course, but just for three years. And yet, 2,000 years later, we sit here and we study his words. We hang on everything he said. How could this be? He had no army, he had no school, he wrote nothing down himself. And yet, the beauty of his life reverberates throughout the whole world. The whole world. How does one account for that? How do you account for that? It must be reckoned with. Jesus must be reckoned with. His light shone so brightly through his temporary art, which was so profound, there's almost no way to explain it. And so I thought about comparing this to, you know, Andrew Goldsworthy is a Scottish artist, and so I thought, you know, given him a lot of publicity, so let's give another Scottish man some publicity. Raise your hand if you know the name Andrew Carnegie. Nice. Americans pronounce it Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie. Now, I don't want anything I'm saying here to be a slight on, on this Andrew. But his life proves my point to some degree. Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish immigrant who grew up in abject poverty. And so his family moved, immigrated to the United States in the 1800s. He eventually became a steel tycoon, and when he sold his company to J.P. Morgan, you may have heard of him, he became the richest human being at that time living on planet Earth. The richest human being living on planet Earth at that time. And then, after he sold his company, he spent the rest of his life, 18 years, trying to give it away. He had a great philanthropic heart, and he, and he gave away his fortune, He built, he was particularly fond of building libraries. He built over 2,500 libraries around the world. He just paid for them himself. Most of them he didn't want his name on, and then after he died, people put his name on it. 90% of his fortune he was able to give away. Billions and billions and billions of dollars he was able to give away. And it's quite shocking that just a little over 100 years after he died, 
Many of us don't know who he is. In our own country, and if we went around the world, many, many would not know who he was. And how different his life was than Jesus, right? So this highlights this difference between culture and power and wealth. So earthly works of art create culture. And culture survives long beyond the group of people who created it or the individual who creates it. Culture changes the world. Power and wealth might run the world in any given moment, but they are always much shorter lived than culture. So what is a human life? It is a potential piece of temporary art that creates world-changing culture. And art transcends the cold, hard realities of its brevity. And you might ask, is there a critic, an art critic, who judges and looks and explains to the masses why one piece of art is hung in a place of prominence in the gallery of antiquity and another is not? Well, the Bible claims that that person is God. And the Bible also claims that in the person of Jesus Christ, the perfect life was lived, and God the Father is elevating the person of Jesus and hanging him on the museum of museums, the masterpiece of your masterpiece, and telling people to gaze upon this art as inspiration for your own art. That's one way to put it the claims of Christianity, to glory in, to praise, to magnify the art that was the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ as the model for true beauty. This beauty included intense suffering, ridicule, pain, bearing upon itself the weight of the world, And God brought it to life again at the resurrection to say, upon this cornerstone, on this art, I will create a culture, one culture to change all cultures into the image of God. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I found my own life, if I hang this beautiful piece of artwork on the walls of my life, if I look at it every day, if I read about it every day, if I sing about it every week, then actually the culture of this art begins to transform me internally and turn me into a like-minded piece of art that hopefully blesses and enriches the world around me. So the question is this, if Jesus' life was the penultimate example of human life as temporary art, does every human life have a similar possibility? Could you conceive of your life as temporary art? Here today, gone tomorrow. A little while you live, and in a little while you die. But in the in-between, There's something that you have a possibility to do that can transform real lives, real place, and real lasting culture for the good of the world and the glory of God. Is that possible? I was thinking about that all week. And then I remembered Ephesians chapter 2. So we're going to read that together. God didn't want to leave that to our own wonderings. He wanted to tell us That's exactly what he's doing. Let's read Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. The Apostle Paul writes this. Once you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too, all of us, previously lived among them in our fleshly desire, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh 
and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. We were all in the same boat. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that, this is very important, so that in the coming ages... A little while, then a little while, in the coming ages, he might display his immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from your own doing. This is not from yourselves. It is, a, it is God's gift, not from our works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. That's the word poema. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. What's Paul saying? He's saying, well, in fact, you are temporary art that God wants to display under heaven for the world to see. That's what he's saying. God came in Jesus, lived the perfect life that we failed to live, died in our place on the cross, took upon himself the penalty of our sin, rose from the grave, and is now seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, and he has sent his spirit to make a workmanship out of you, to make a masterpiece out of you, to turn you into the same kind of art that Jesus was. You will never die for anyone's sin. You will never save anyone, but you will represent or display the grace of God to the world when they look at your life and they say, how did you become the way you are? I like the look of that. Jesus and his grace. That's what you'll say. This is the craziest part of God's plan. That he is showcasing or displaying each and every one of you who by faith are trusting in the grace of God for life. And you are being transformed, the scriptures say, 2 Corinthians, from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians 3.18, if you want to look that up. It says you're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Ultimate glory is Jesus Christ, the masterpiece of masterpiece. And you, by the Spirit, allowing God to do His work in you, are being transformed into a masterpiece that reflects the same culture that Jesus Christ came and won through the cross and the resurrection. Wow. Yeah, you're temporary. I don't know how many more days on this earth you have to be displayed by God. You're temporary. But you are eternal in your impact. That's what Jesus shows us. The most temporary of lives he lived. The most eternal glory he continues to radiate. Now, what does suffering have to do with that project? Everything. Everything. If the masterpiece of masterpieces had to go through death and suffering and the pain of the cross, what might you have to go through? The tools that God uses include hard surfaces, sharp edges, heat, cold, friction. All of these tools are like paintbrushes in the hand of the Father. And he tells us right here through Jesus, and he shows us through the cross that he's not afraid to use them so that you might display the grace of God to the world. Jesus says, don't be surprised if the Father uses suffering to turn you into glory. 
He did it with his own son. And he wants to do it with you. It's not all suffering, all the time. But he will ask you to walk into and through places that you don't think are good ideas. Because he's doing something far greater than you could ever see. So will you accept God's offer? Can you find great joy in knowing that your life is but a temporary art project? Can you find great joy in being the extension of the goodness of God to the world? Can you find great joy in the midst of your suffering knowing that it is necessary for you to become the beacon of hope, mercy, and peace that points people to the fountain of God's blessing in Jesus Christ? Will you accept that offer? If you answer yes, I promise you that as your life progresses, you will not hate the brevity of it like you once did. You will not find yourself believing that your life doesn't matter. You will not choose to chase pleasures and run from discomforts like you once did. Don't be naive. Jesus is very clear. It will not be easy. You will want to run from this at times. The disciples, even after hearing the promise, they ran when suffering came their way. But then they came back. And God also always welcomes us back. But like a mother who looks into her rearview mirror and sees her sweet baby sitting in the car seat, God won't regret the pain that he's allowed to come through your story, and you won't regret the pain that God has allowed into your story. When you see the joy that has been set before you the way Jesus saw the joy set before him of the cross. The master craftsman will make our lives into a thing of eternal beauty and eternal wonder because that is what he created us to be. So, I say, I say this final sentence. Very, very, the way I've worded this is very important. So what are you waiting for? Go. Be art. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. 